Hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel, Knits by Mandy. My name is Amanda and this is the 22nd episode of the Knits by Mandy podcast. These are monthly check-in videos where I talk about my knitting progress and what I've been working on. I have a finished object to share for this month as well as some acquisitions that correspond with some knitting plans that I have for the spring. I'm also working on a spring cleaning series where I talk about refreshing my knit wardrobe. So keep an eye out for that. Where I talk more in depth about some projects that I've already knit that I'm trying to refresh or give new life to. I am currently wearing the Mauricia cardigan. This is by Vert and Rose Knitting. I knit this in Knitting for All of Dusty Artichoke held double. Finish it around this time last year, just in time for my birthday, which is coming up shortly. It has become a spring favorite. It's just a really easy, unfussy thing to put on. I love the texture. It's a great sweater. I wanted to wear my finished object today, but it is actually too warm. It is March 3rd when I'm filming and it's like 65 degrees today. So uh, I don't know if this is a false spring or if spring is fully here yet but it's definitely too warm to wear what I'm about to show you. And that is my finished loom sweater by Sari Nordland. I have had it on my list for a long time to knit a color work sweater and I selected the loom sweater. Look how pretty it is to kind of fit that bill and to be my first color work yoked sweater. And I'm really happy about this sweater. I'm very excited with the finished object. I have not really worn it out yet into the world because how warm the sweater is and how warm the temperatures are right now. But I think this will be something I honestly will, might have to wait until winter again to get a lot of wear out of, but maybe there will be a few more cooler days. I can whip this out. I was sad. I wore this on Zoom calls and no one complimented. It's fine. I didn't knit this so people could ask me, did you make it? And I say, yeah, that's okay. That's not why I made it fully. Anyway, I made this in the suggested yarn and colorways. This is Cascade 220. I know the white is natural. I'm, the brown color is slipping my memory right now, but I'll put it in the description. And it's in the pattern as well if you decide to buy it. And when I was looking at the finished object pictures, I thought that this color was a charcoal gray, but it's really kind of a dark heathered brown which I'm not mad about, but just know that if you're going for the selected color, it's definitely more of a dark brown than it is a dark gray. I have knit with this yarn before. I absolutely love it. It's such a solid work workhorse yarn at what I feel is a reasonable price. It knits up so nicely in color work as well. You knit the yoke on five millimeter needles, so it knits up so quickly. This block, so I had, you know, some tension and pulling, around I think it was definitely around this first row of ivy because I had a lot of stitches on a short cable so this my stitches were a little bunched but really everything blocked out very nicely the only thing that I'm still kind of unsure about is the collar it is quite high and I'll show you how it lays I will try it on um, just so you can see what it looks like see how long I last in it if I get sweaty you can see why this would be like quite a warm sweater to wear. The neck comes up quite high. I did knit it a little shorter than instructed and I thought maybe I would fold it down and I think I just have to wear this more to see how I feel about it that I can maybe like pick up and maybe knit a few extra rows to fold this over or I just fold it over like this. I think this is like a little too short. Let me know what you think. I don't know. I feel like it almost takes away. Like this almost looks like collar at least. I don't hate it like this. I didn't think I would like it, but I don't mind it so far. It's kind of like a mock neck almost. And I think the color work really pops quite well on camera. The contrast is just like, and the motifs are inspired, I believe by water lilies in Sweden. I just love it. I love the botanical feel. I love that it's kind of like a classic feeling sweater. I have never owned anything like this. And I think it's a really fun thing to show people that you've knit. A few more notes about the construction. I knit a size three, and there are also two opportunities for short row shaping in the sweater, right after you separate for sleeves and then once before you bind off. And I did that to make the back longer, which definitely helped. And I think 
like makes the sweater feel better. I made the sweater quite cropped because I knew this was going to be very warm. I have a bunch of yarn if I ever want to change the length so far. I think it seems good to me, but I have that option. But I think having something kind of like really almost constrictive and like very covered up on top, but having a nice crop bottom, I think balances the sweater out nicely. The only other issue I had with knitting the sweater was the sleeves. So I followed the sleeve instructions exactly. When I originally knit the sleeves before blocking, they were a little bit longer than they were now and came over my hand. So I knew after blocking, they were gonna be, I think, too long for my preference. In the pattern, it says knit when you're five inches from where you want the sleeve to end. And I thought just because mine were so long that this was longer than five inches, but I double checked and this is about just a little over five inches. So I think I must've just measured the length of my arm incorrectly and I ended up with very long sleeves. Either way, I decided to try out grafting for the first time and it was pretty fun to be honest with you. Because I decided to do the color work cuff I was like doing the mental calculus of will it take me longer to redo the sleeve color work or to graft in the end I think it's probably like a wash of what is more efficient or quicker but I did just kind of want to try out grafting as a skill that I have not used before honestly I loved the idea of cutting through knitting like that sounded almost thrilling and like something that you don't always good to do. I decided to try that out. I made a reel over on Instagram if you want to see that process. But basically, if you have not grafted knitting before, if you want to like take out length, but you maybe want to preserve something that's on the end, you put in lifelines, which is just basically threading a string through one leg of your stitches so that when you rip back, uh, the stitches are live and then you can then put those stitches on a needle. You put two of those in, you make a cut into your knitting and then you can unravel. And then you'll have basically two tubes that you Kitchener stitch together. And there are also, I think, some other methods other than Kitchener stitch, Kitchener stitch to graft items together. But that is what I decided to use for the cuffs. And it's very similar, it's like a very similar pattern to tubular bind off with like the knit off pearl pearl off knit kind of vibe it it flowed for me and it was honestly quite fun so i did do a little sweater so sweater surgery this is where i grafted and i think honestly you can't tell it it came out fine. All's well that ends well with the loom pullover. I'm really happy with it. Now, I'm not like someone that skis or goes skiing, but I feel like this would be a sweater that you would wear like under your ski bib and you'd be so comfy, cozy, and like stylish on the slopes. I don't do that, but if I did, great sweater to wear this for. All in all, very happy with the pattern. It was clear, easy to understand. I think the fit is good. The short row shaping for a circular yoke is definitely appreciated. And I love the look of the sweater. I think it's very cool. I can't wait to style this in winter and maybe, maybe a few outfits coming up here in the spring, but we'll see. So that is my loom sweater by Starry Norlin. Let's see how long I can keep this on. Maybe the rest of the episode. I don't get overheated. That's the only finished object I have from this month. I am doing a graduate certificate program, so I'm like kind of in school as well as working right now. There is definitely less time for both knitting and making videos. This is like my off weekend in between courses, so I'm trying to batch some content and get some knitting done as well. And then it's kind of like that thing of like, do I make content or do I knit? And I've been mostly leaning way towards more knitting when I can. So anyway, that's kind of just like how my pace has been. It's definitely been slower, which I don't mind. I feel like it's giving me more time to enjoy the things that I'm working on. It's okay. You know, there's nothing to lose by slowing down and taking stock of what you're working with and what you have. And that's kind of what my focus is on for this spring. So we'll kind of combine acquisitions and future plans. I'll show you a few new yarns that I've bought and some other things that I'm planning for the spring. Over on Instagram, I asked folks to pick a color for a Lenark sweater by the Crayabea. And this is a quarter zip sweater knit in half fisherman's rib. It was in between this lilac color or this really bright 
yellow lime. I decided to buy the sweater quantity in lilac, but then I bought about four balls of the green just for like a fun pop of color. I even played around with the idea of doing a sweater with like contrasting cuffs in a collar, but I decided I like that idea, but maybe not for the Lenark. So this is Saniskarn Pure Gint. This is their DK Norwegian wool. I would say this is kind of like more in line with the Cascade yarn as far as feel goes. It's not as soft as a merino, but I really kind of love that toothiness of a wool that's like, that sits in between a merino and maybe like a rustic rustic wool. I'm excited to work with this. And then I did swatch it up as well in the two colors. Here's my swatch with the light lilac in the Half Fisherman's Rib. I'm really, really into it. I'm very excited to get started. I went to start it on Friday night and then it has a provisional cast on and I was like, I can't think about this right now. Like I need to be able to lock in. So maybe I will start working on that. Maybe this evening, it's a Sunday. I have like a little extra time. Kind of like get engrossed and get really into it. Just did a one by one swatch of the green yellow yarn. Um, I'm planning on making some accessories with it and I'll go ahead and show you what I've started so far. This is the only other whip I have on the needles right now. And this is the Weekend Hat by Petite Knit. I am once again trying out a Petite Knit hat pattern. We'll see how it goes. After my Oslo hat, which I showed you last month, I frogged that and I still have to decide what I wanna do with that yarn. Let's revisit that in a second. But for now, I am going to make this hat and then although like quickly coming out of winter accessory weather but that's okay i'm going to knit i think maybe like some kind of kerchief sophie scarf-esque companion to the hat i've realized that i really really like scarves and having little things to tie around my neck i'm very much into it i love my little sophie scarf i have my solo shawl scarf by kadri as well that i love i think that's a really fun spring accessory i'm into them I'm excited about the prospect of having lots of little like ties and such for my neck a kerchief if you will that's really what i'm planning so far i have yet to cast on lenark but i think that will be my next sweater as well as some accessories on the side and then I have three skeins of like a sport weight color changing yarn and I'm regretting that I bought them all in the same color. I'm gonna put that yarn on hold for now because I'm not sure what I want to use with that. And that is the Mono State Uruguay Marla. I showed it in my last video. I made the also hat with it and then I didn't like it. I thought of doing like a shift cowl by Andrea Mowry. I don't think it'll look as cool because it doesn't have multiple colors. It just has the one colorway. I didn't really honestly know what I I was getting myself into with the color changing yarn but it is kind of a lot so we'll see where that leads me i'm not quite sure what i'll do with that yet that might be on hold until i don't know the fall we'll see the last thing that i want to do which i am going to make a whole video about is re-knit my whitmore sweater i made a video where i talk about this plan more in depth the short of it is that i want to frog it and knit a lento sweater in it this is just the swatch that i made for that this is mayflower easy care merino in kid silk and I think the color is like cherry blossom or something. It's really pretty. And this is it knit in six millimeter needles. So it's a very light kind of stretchy fabric. And the Lento is a sweater that was sweeping the nation truly last year. And it is kind of just like a, a creative and playful take on knitting with a mohair and a wool together, giving you kind of a bigger gauge to work with. That is exciting to me. And also I feel like the Lenark will be longer. It is in half fisherman rib. So that will just take longer. I'm assuming the Lento from my understanding will knit up very quickly. Usually not a two sweater on the needle kind of girl, but I think it might be nice to have these two going. I still have to kind of frog everything and get that process started but that's what i'm thinking about i would like to actually do that today so after i film this those are my plans and i feel like that feels like a lot considering i have just finished really like a scarf a hat and a sweater this year and the scarf was already mostly done 
<laughs> so like I said, it's a different pace that I'm just kind of getting used to. And at the end of the day, it'll it's good that I'm doing these classes. So with that, it's time for my media review section. I talk about what I've been watching, what I've been reading. Let's talk about the Akatar series by Sarah J. Moss. I have not finished it yet. I have read the first three books. I thought I was going to skip the little novella, but then I started reading the fifth one. And then I was like, oh, they're already referencing things that happened in the novella. Like I have to read it. So I'm going to go back and read it. Uh, I don't want the Sarah J. Moss heads to come after me and I'm not yucking your yum, but this is not my kind of yum. I'm not yumming. I will say, let's do a compliment sandwich here. I liked the second book. I thought the second book was way stronger than the third. And I did love a little enemies to lovers storyline. Like I found like that was the like best part of the book, like seeing that relationship grow. But that being said, I do have a running notes list of, of grievances with this book. So don't mind if I do. You're probably like, am I still watching a knitting video? You are. Before we fully dive in, I'm not a fantasy person. I don't gravitate towards fantasy. The last probably like my fantasy book I read was Harry Potter in which like you're being, you know, submersed into a whole different kind of world with different rules of logic. I understand that like the escapism that can offer it. And I have often really enjoyed getting lost into the world that Sarah J Moss has created. I particularly enjoy like the different courts and how like, just like reading every time kind of favorite gets to discover a new court and like going to the summer court then going to the day court like or the dawn court was it i enjoy that like i enjoy reading about like the settings themselves i however have a lot of qualms with the magic and how it works in this book and for me unfortunately it's keeping me from fully enjoy like being um, submersed being fully immersed in the books and like fully immersed in the world because then I go, wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. That's my sticking point. And then I also don't love where we're going like love interest wise with like the three guys and the three sisters. Like I don't love that. It's a little like, okay, whatever. But, but what I will say, especially for the second book, she really keeps you on the edge of your seat. Here's my list. Of things that I don't like about these books. A plot device that Sarah J Moss uses, especially in the first two books, is info dumping. And to an extent, I understand that this has to happen as we're in Faber's shoes, as she's learning about this foreign world. But it happens at the end of the first book, or like towards the end of the first book, with Alice, where Alice tells her there was no blight. It's actually this woman named Amarantha and there was a curse and he had to fall in love with you. And she made us all ugly by putting beautiful ornate gold masks on our faces. Da -da 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 -da. Like this is where you need to go. Don't make any bargains. And Faber goes, did you say make bargains? Like that whole thing happens. And then it happens when she meets the night court for the first time. They're like, it's an incredibly long chapter where they're sitting around the dinner table just like trauma dumping on her. And I'm like, this is a choice, but okay. It also happens at the end of the second book where Rysand, or Rysand, I think it's Rysand. I think it's, it's Reese. Rysand is like, oh yeah, by the way, like, I'm sorry that I drugged you, but like, it's because you're my mate, my mate, my mate, my mate. Like drink every time they say my mate, my mate, you're mine. We'll die, don't, don't drink the fairy wine, girl. Like it was because I loved you. And then we're all just supposed to be like, okay. That's just a separate complaint, but like, that's like a device that I'm like, I don't really know. I don't have a suggestion for how to work around that, but now it feels like you're just like covering ground because you're like covering your ass in a way. The issue I have is that in the beginning of the second book, Faber has horrible like PTSD from killing people and being like held as captive and kidnapped for three months um, and like being malnourished and having to fight a giant worm. So I would too. Just as quickly as Faber learns how to read, I feel like her PTSD vanishes just because like she's with Rhysand and like, she's like, oh, like we've both been afflicted by the same person. Like, I don't really care about it anymore. Like. She just like disappears really. It's such a big part, like what afflicts her in the spring court. And then like it out of thin air, it's gone. 
And here's where maybe I am not a fantasy girly because I really want all the, like the magic things to make sense and I understand that it's magic. To me, it doesn't like, it's not clicking fully. We hear so much about how Reesan is the most powerful High Lord in all of Prithian, Perithian, and he is so powerful, but like all of the time these people are being thwarted. At every turn, there is a trap that they are falling into and they are often like seemingly not the most powerful people. Comma, why doesn't he just read everyone's mind? I know like morals, ethics, but I feel like you would have saved a lot of bloodshed if we just maybe like slipped into people's minds more often and controlled them. The other High Lords are also powerful, but like he's the most powerful, but like not that powerful basically. This one's pretty nitpicky. The different powers that are associated with each court. So autumn is fire, summer is water, spring logically you can shape shift. It's woof, you can turn into a woof if you're in the spring court, but only like Tamlin can. I haven't even like touched on Tamlin. Like he's kind of like dead to me. Like I don't really even care. Like I'm over him. The cauldron. Let's talk about the cauldron for 20 minutes because that's how long I could talk about. So in the first book, they talk about lore of this world is that it was poured out from a cauldron and that's how it was created. And I'm like, cool metaphor. Like Greek mythology metaphor. Like it didn't actually happen. It would actually happen. The cauldron's a real thing that a person who's also named an island is in ownership of. How did we let that happen? It did create the entire universe and is incredibly powerful, but it got tired after turning hu two human girls into fairies. I understand that's like Nesta's whole thing is that she took something from it. How that worked, unclear to me. Rhysand and his friends actually invented feminism. I don't know if you guys knew that. They said it's her body, her choice. And I'm supposed to like swoon just because he's like, you have a choice. That's crazy. Women's rights. They come from men. Although you do need male allies in your fight for liberation. However, like, I need to like idolize them. Okay? Like they're doing the bare minimum. I'm being honest. I did have a complaint that there were no queer characters until there were. So I was happy with that. I was getting really heated. I was like, what do you mean people are alive for centuries and no one's just a little gay? That was like, that, that took me out guys. I will be honest. But that gets resolved in the third book. This social hierarchy as kind of a comparison to maybe social or systemic inequities that we have in the real world with like the high fae and the lesser fae. By the way, the people that are trying to liberate and equalize the lesser fae just keep referring them, referring to them as the lesser fae. And I'm like, language is powerful people. Maybe we don't do that. And I have some questions about Sarah J Maas making the high fae like super hot I understand that they're more powerful inherently, but like, did we also have to make them super hot? And then the lesser fae have skin that is either described as gray or the texture of bark. Like maybe don't bake eugenics into your social hierarchies. I don't know. It like, I'm like, it's not landing for me. Learn about heavily in the first book is how much mortals are afraid of fairies. And like, of course, Feyre has to get over that eventually. And she's like, oh, I kind of like my fairy. Like he's kind of cool. So what I would understand about all of the other queens in that land is that they also hate the fairies because they also like, there was a war and they killed a lot of humans. But they are able to be convinced by King slash Island Highburn that they can become fairies because of immortality. They were like, oh right, they're immortal. So like, that's cool. So now I'm down with it. That was never really like a clear motivation to me. And I think I learned, you learn more about the Queens in the sex, in the sex book. So, okay. But the language choices of Sarah J Maas, including but not limited to hissing, purring, I kid you not, watery bowels, mate, my mate, my mate is mine, my mate, my mate, my mate, my mate. I wrote down ripples of muscle, but that one's actually not so bad. She uses that like sparingly. And then also they are always throwing each other a vulgar gesture. And I don't know about you guys, but the more often I read vulgar gesture, the more and like less vulgar this gesture is in my head. And like, are they just flicking each other off? Can't you just say that? It leads, it, you're leaving too much to the imagination. Again, that's pretty nick, nick picky. The whole like Amarantha is so evil that her most like evil and diabolical thing that she can think of is bonding people to masks is like, okay to me. And 
I'm like, sure. Don't think too much about the whole like Tamlin having to fall in love with a human. Like, don't think too much about it because it's really gonna pull you out of the story. Like calls to like, except when it doesn't and only when it's convenient. Four seasonal courts and seven celestial courts. In the four seasonal courts, it is those seasons all the time in those courts. But in the night court, dawn court, and day court, they still have all of those things. Okay, I feel like that was kind of like an incomplete thought there. Oh my God, in the first book, all Feyre talks about is how time must move differently for fairies because they're alive forever. Why do these books take us like day by day then if fairy time moves differently? Like she makes comments and comments about how fairies, like fairy time must move differently. But then like when it comes down to the book and how time moves, it doesn't it like moves the same way, which like I can kind of understand like that would be like a lot, but we talk a lot about it, but I don't really see any practical ramifications of that. Last thing, I don't know if evolution was a thing for the fairies. Like, I don't know why they are the way they are. Why would your most like powerful asset, your ability to fly, why would they be extremely sensitive? That's like having a like your body made of an Achilles tendon. Is it only for the sex scenes? Because I think it is. My thoughts and complaints about Akatar. To put the compliment sandwich, despite all of this, I have enjoyed myself. I've enjoyed talking about it with my friend. I am I'm losing steam a little here on the last books. I don't think I will be a Sarah J. Moss head. I don't think fantasy is for me, but that's okay. And again, if you like these books and you like love them, I love that for you. Like I literally cannot speak as someone whose favorite media is The Real Housewives. Like, So those are my thoughts on media, Akatar, knitting. I've definitely thought about Akatar a lot more, maybe even the knitting this year, but here we are. Thank you so much if you made it this far to the end of the video and my complaining and ranting and reveling. Stay tuned for my spring cleaning refresh series and I will see you all soon. Bye.